Marlene, are you able to hear us while we're waiting on Ramona? I see we have Jessica. Jessica, we've gone around to introduce ourselves, um, saying our name and what faith community organization we're representing. Would you like to do the same? Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, my name is Jessica Garcia. I am uh, with Catholic Charities, Migration and Refugee Services. Thank you. Thank you, Ramona. Did you, uh, we went over the group agreements. We can start, uh, we're gonna um, transition to Jesse and Chloe. Actually, yeah, Chloe's gonna get us started. Well, the slides are getting ready. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Chloe Lee. I'm a data scientist here at the Fairfax County Department of Management and Budget. Um, I'm a data person, so I am going to share some of the high-level findings of the 2021 Youth Survey, especially in the area of youth mental health, with specific focus on our LGBTQ students. Um, and to give you a brief overview before I talk about the numbers and percentages, the youth survey is given to 6th, 8th, 10th, and 12th grade FCPS students. It's all student survey. It's, it's administered every year except for 2020 due to the pandemic. Um, it is a comprehensive survey and it covers many topics, um, including alcohol, tobacco, and other drug use. Um, mental health, bullying, nutrition, physical activity, and many other things. And also the survey is anonymous. Um, no identifying information for the student is stored with the results and it is voluntary. So students are instructed that they may decline to answer any of the questions on the survey or may completely opt out of taking the survey. And most of the questions, they have a lot of, we ask a lot of questions, actually probably like too many. It's over like 170 questions. And then those questions are derived from nationally validated surveys, including the Monitoring the Future Survey by NIH um, and the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey, YRBS by CDC. And we make comparisons with the national data whenever possible and appropriate. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, yeah. Um, and in 2021, um, over 44,000 students in grade six, eight, 10th, and 12th participated in the survey. And that's about 78% of the enrolled students in those grades. And last year, for the first time, youth survey was administered electronically. So before it was all paper and pencil, but last year we changed it to the web survey. And um, the survey was also translated into seven languages in addition to English, so that students could choose their language of preference so that we try to be a little bit more inclusive so the students can um, choose their language and then they can actually uh, um, take the survey um, what for what uh, language in language of their preference. The analysis that I'm sharing today um, is based on the 2021 survey, which was administered November 2021 last year. Um, it's mostly based on the 8th, 10th, and 12th grade survey, unless it says the data is from the 6th grade survey. With that background information, let's take a look at some of the data. Hey, Chloe, can I ask a quick question? Sure. So you saw 78% response for 2021. How yes. does that compare to previous responses? Excellent question. So previous years, it's used around like 81%-ish, 81, 82. So it was like a little over 80 always. But last year, um, so there, 
you know, where's the media coverage about you survey? So some, I think more students opted out. Um, and we got a lot of inquiries about, you know, whether the students um, will have to answer all the questions. And then if we have some like inappropriate questions and things like that, but um, because of all that, it went down a little bit, but it was not too bad. It was not too low or anything. So would it, would it, would you agree with saying the fact that it was all electronic puts some people, I don't know, uneasy because of the, they don't know where the data is going or because, because it, it, I would have thought had you not said it was higher previously that an electronic version would have increased the number of responses because mm -hmm. everyone's on electronic devices. Uh, but it seems kind of the opposite where they may not trust the electronic submissions or uh, and I know you don't yeah. know really, really I mean, don't yeah. know the answer, I, but I, I just find it curious that mm -hmm. as electronic as our youth are, that the number would have gone down. And and again, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but I just find it interesting. Absolutely. And that's a good point too. Like um and then in tech, well, technically, in terms of, you know, all that like anonymity and then the privacy of the data, um, we make sure to capture the, you know, only the quality data and, you know, anonymity and privacy is our uh, really our um, top priority. So um, student might have thought that, but my like i don't know if this is true or not my thinking is that because of a little bit of political dynamic last year with all the elections and everything i think that probably would have contributed a little bit more but that's a good point like um and we'll see like what happens this year as well um but um we'll monitor um the percentages and then the participation rate um continuously and see what happens thank you Sure. Okay, and then moving on to the mental health data. So youth survey includes questions targeting mental health and well-being among youth, including persistent sadness or hopelessness. So we asked students if they felt so sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks or more in a row that they stopped doing usual activities in the past year. And we also ask questions about suicidal thoughts and suicidal attempts. And according to the data, 38% of the students in 8th, 10th, and 12th grades felt so sad or hopeless that they couldn't do the usual activities for two weeks or more in the past year. And 17% seriously considered attempting suicide and 6% uh, attempted suicide. And in addition, a third of sixth grade students reported feeling so sad or hopeless that they stopped engaging in regular activity in the past year. And we do not ask suicide related questions to sixth graders. Any questions on the slide? Okay, moving on to the next um, slide. Just a quick question. Yeah, Is sure. it all right to screenshot slides? I'm sorry, what was that? Is it okay to take a screenshot of slides? Um, I don't know, Suzette, would that be okay? Like, I can share we, this slide as well. Yes, we're going to send a link to the to this presentation. It'll be in the chat, so you can have the whole presentation. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and in 2021, the rates of feeling persistent sadness or hopelessness among Fairfax County youth were the highest since 2015. And actually the highest in the past 10 years, if you look at the data from 2010. Um, from 2019, so this was before the pandemic, there was a, an eight percentage point increase in the number of students reporting this level of sadness or hopelessness. And the trend was also held for sixth graders. And both suicidal thoughts and attempts were the highest recorded since 2015 although the changes are not too big, um, especially for suicide attempts. Um, but the good news is that um, the, despite the increase this year, Fairfax County youth still reported um, 
lower rates of mental health issues compared to their national peers. And it has been the case in the past, and it was the case last year as well. Moving on to the next slide. And consistent with previous year's data and with national trend, um, female students were more likely to report mental health related issues than male students. And in 2021, almost half of female students in Fairfax County reported feeling so sad or hopeless that they couldn't do the usual activities for two weeks or more in the past year, whereas 27% of male students reported so. And female students were also almost two times more likely to report suicidal thoughts and suicide attempts than male students. And more than one in five female students reported suicidal ideations and 8% reported attempting suicide um, in the past year. And the rates for male students were significantly lower. Um, so 11% for suicidal thoughts and 4% for suicide attempts. Next slide, please. Similarly, the rates for mental health issues differ by race and ethnicity. Um, as you can see on the slides, um, students who identify as other or multiple race or as Hispanic were more likely to experience mental health challenges than white, Asian, or black students in the um, report. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, um, students from food secure homes were like more likely to report uh, mental health challenges than students from food in uh, food secure homes. This is not really surprising, but so in this analysis, food security question was used as kind of a proxy for students' socioeconomic status. And students were asked how often they went hungry um, due to a lack of food in their home. And more than 62% of the students from, um, that's almost like 67% of the students from um, food insecure homes reported feeling sad or hopeless. And about 32% reported they had considered suicide in the past year. 18% reported that they had attempted suicide, which was significantly higher for, um, than the students from food secure homes. And in Fairfax County, nearly 7% of 8, 10th, and 12th grade students reported going hungry in the past month due to lack of food in their home. Um, and incidents of hunger also differ by race and ethnicity, ranging from 3% of white students and 12% of Hispanic students. Hey, Chloe, this is Mike yes. again, and I apologize for- No, no, I have, if question, you have any questions, but, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> but are there- terms of reference so that when you say uh, sadness how is that defined I mean how do, how do the 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 youth I um, understand that what you mean by sadness is something they're feeling or hopelessness I mean do they know what do we explain what hopelessness means uh, you know if you go back a slide if you could uh, I forget the term that was used um like other multiple you know how is i don't i don't know what that means outside of hispanic white uh asian and black mm -hmm. um so is there something that i can kind of wrap my arms around just to understand the data so that if in you know if i if i choose to use some of this information to educate the youth and explain to them you know what's going on in in their world that I can actually have the, the right metrics or definitions? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So in terms of persistent sadness or hopelessness, so we this question is actually from a national survey. Um, we're using that like nationally validated survey. And then the question states, do you feel sad or hopeful? Did you in the during the past 12 months, did you ever feel so sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks or more in a row that you stop doing some usual activities. So we do not specifically define um, sadness or hopelessness itself, but then we define it as, you know, the extent to which like that have they have to feel sad or hopeless. So they really drop everything. Well, 
stop doing something that they usually enjoy or engage in. So um, that is the question. And that's a good point that they might not be really, un they might not really understand what really this question might mean. Um, but um, considering that they are six, eight, 10th and 12th grade students, um, I think that, you know, as a, you know, grand scheme of, scheme of things and then in a, in a large scale, um, the changes in the percentages probably like mean something because even if some people don't understand what that really means and the prop students might de define it a little bit differently. But then if you look at the overall percentages, if we see some like uptick, that probably means something. Um, some changes are going on in the community. But at an individual level, yeah, I'm not sure if everybody is on the same page about like what really that what that really means. I think the point is that they kind of perceive that way that you know they are are sad and then hopeless that then um, they cannot really do anything for two weeks or more. Um, I think it's the perceivedness, like per, uh, perceived sadness or hopelessness, is kind of the question that we're getting at. And also other and multiple, that's uh, uh, that's also the self-report as well. That's the category that we, um, that uh, the national survey uses as well. So we have white um, race question and ethnic qu the city question separately. For race, um, we use um, white, black, um, Asian, um, other, and multiple. And then for um, ethnicity question, are you Hispanic um, or or Latina or Latino and uh, yes or no. So we, we use those categories, but that's how students actually define themselves. That answers. No, that, that's perfect. Thank you, Chloe. I, uh, I just happen to have a daughter uh, who is now in college, but would have fallen right into this category mm -hmm. of hopelessness. And uh, I was just kind of curious how we were viewing it. But like you said, I think the, the kids know and they're going to report out how they feel. So thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay, now then let's move on to the transgender um, students. So we also found that transgender students reported significantly higher rates of experiencing the sadness or hopelessness as, um, as well as suicidal thoughts and actions than um, their non-transgender peers. So transgender students were more than twice um, likely to report feeling um, sadness or hopelessness, persistent sadness or hopelessness. So 75% of um, them reported experiencing this level of sadness compared to 36% of non-transgender students. And over 60% of transgender students reported having considered attempting suicide in the past year, um, which is really concerning, um, whereas a little over 14% of non-transgender students reported the experience. And almost one in four, that's 24% um, transgender students reported uh, attempting suicide in the past year, as compared to only 5% of non-transgender students. Now, students who identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual also reported higher rates of feelings of persistent sadness or hopelessness, suicidal ideations, and suicide attempts than heterosexual students. You can see in the graph that they are about two to five times more likely to experience mental health challenges than their heterosexual peers. On to the next slide. So um, here are some of the related challenges um, that could affect youth mental health. And one of them is obviously substance use. While we observe some historic lows in the prevalence of substance or alcohol use among Fairfax County students this year, Overall, um, still 17% reported any substance or alcohol use in the past month when the survey was administered. And I also look at the breakdown by sexual orientations, um, gender identity, and food security status as well. And as you can see in the charts, um, students um, who identify as gay, lesbian, and bisexual reported higher rates of substance use than heterosexual students. 
and um, transgender students also reported higher rates than their um, non-transgender peers. And students uh, from food insecure homes are all, um, also more likely to report substance use in the past month than students from food secure homes. And there have been like plenty of research out there that showed correlations between substance use and mental health. And you can see that students are um, disproportionately um, experiencing substance use by sexual orientation, gender identity, and by food security status, which may exacerbate the disparities in mental well being across different student groups. And then um, our data also shows that students who use any substances are much more likely to experience mental health issues than students who did not report substance use. Um, if you look at the left side of the slide, among the students who use substances, almost 60%, that's a brown bar in the first graph, um, reported persistent sadness or hopelessness, and more than 32% seriously consider suicide, and 15% attempted suicide, which are significantly higher than the rates for students who did not report substance use. And if you look at the LGBTQ youth specifically on the right side, the, as that is students um, it identify as either gay, lesbian, um, le bisexual, or transgender. And if they report a substance use, they the rates go even higher. Um, they are already uh, at risk population for mental health challenges and substance use adds even more risk to this group. Um, moving on to the next section. Yeah, I also looked at Fairfax County students' rates for participation in religious services or activities on a regular basis. We have that question on a regular basis is at least once or twice a month. And overall, 31% of the students reported religious activities ranging from 34% of eighth graders and 28% of 12th graders. So as they get older, they are less likely to participate in religious activities on a regular basis. And while there was no visible difference between female and male students, there were some differences by race and ethnicity. So more than 40% of black students and more than one third of Asian students um, reported religious activities at least once a month, which was higher than the rates for Hispanic, other or white students. Hey, Chloe, can you go back one slide? So um, I think no. one more. Oh, no, no, it's like we're going oh, the other way. Let's, yeah. let's go back. Back one? Right, backward. I think this is it. Yeah, so I, I'm curious uh -huh. if there is any, was there a question about the fact that somebody was LGBTQ and the relationship for, um, and the relationship to substance use, i.e. because you were LGBTQ, did you feel you needed to uh, I don't know, fit in or find a way to fit in and and use, I, I think that's it right there. Because I mean, 81%, that, that seems really, really high uh, for that community. Yes. So I, again, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't know all the relationships between some of the questions, but I'm, I mean, that's an awful statistic in, in my <laughs> eyes that, that mm -hmm. those students um, were you, you know, with substance use, uh, were, were reporting out what they reported. Yes, it is really concerning. So the, we don't have a question that asks specifically like, oh, because you're LGBTQ, do you feel like you, you know, want to engage in like substance user and other risk behaviors? We don't have that question, but the data points 
that, you know, like LGBTQ students are definitely um, at risk population for a lot of risk behaviors, including substance use, mental health and bullying and emotional abuse, physical abuse. I did an entire analysis actually on this population. Well, as part of like my report, I can share um, the link to my report and you can see a little bit more um, in-depth analysis of this population as well. But this is actually your survey data. So probably it's really difficult to um, analyze the causal relationships, like what causes what, right? Okay. But um, but definitely data points out that, you know, we need to probably focus on this population because they are much more likely to engage in um, risk behaviors and they, you know, a lot of mental health challenges and symptoms, they definitely show higher rates than their non-LGBTQ peers. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, of course. And then, okay, so the religious sector, can you go back one slide actually? Like, yeah, so religious activities for um, the next slide, yeah, about that. Uh, no, this one slide back, please. Sorry, yeah. There are some religious activities and then I look at the religious activities by gender identity, sexual orientation and food security status as well. So if you look at the graphs here, you can see that gay, lesbian and bisexual students reported a lot lower rates of religious activities than heterosexual students. And transgender students are also almost like twice as less likely to report the experience than non-transgender um, students. And students from food insecure homes were also less likely to report religious activities than students from food secure homes. Next slide, please. And then the next thing that I looked at was whether students participated in um, religious services or activities are better off in terms of mental health challenges, which might be interesting to this group. And the data suggests that yes, that is likely the case. So of course, again, this is a survey data, so we can't really make causal claims, but overall, students who reported regular participation in religious activities reported lower rates of mental health challenges, including persistent sadness or hopelessness, um, suicide ideations and suicide attempt. Um, moving on to the next slide. And then I look into the data more in depth. So do religious activities provide some protections for mental health challenges for LGBTQ kids as well? The results are kind of mixed. So for the LGBTQ group, Students who reported religious activities um, showed lower rates of persistent sadness or hopelessness than the students who did not report religious activities, which is good news. However, they showed slightly higher rates of suicidal ideations and suicide attempts than LGBTQ students who did not report religious activities on a regular basis. Okay, now Jesse will talk about this soon, but I'll touch upon how important it is for students to have assets or protective factors in the light of mental health. So the research suggests that students have, who have assets or protective factors that promote positive development in youth, they're less likely to engage in risk behaviors. And those assets or protective factors are the support that the students need from their family, school, community, um, such as having community adults to talk to or having parents available for help. And according to the data, students with no or few protective factors are much more likely to report mental health issues. Um, and so if you look at the um, graph on the right side, blue line, almost 7% of the 70% of the students with no protective factors reported um, feelings of persistent sadness or hopelessness. And about 45% reported suicidal ideations, that's a brown line. 
and over 25 reported 25% reported suicidal attempts um, in the past year, green line. Um, in comparison, students with just three assets, that's in the middle, the rates go down significantly. And if you have all six assets, you are least likely to experience mental health challenges. Next slide, please. Yeah, and similar patterns were observed, um, the slide before, please. Yeah, similar patterns are observed for um, LGBTQ students. So even though the differences between LGBTQ and non-LGBTQ students remain throughout all asset levels, so they are more likely to experience mental health challenges, but LGBTQ students with more assets are less likely to report mental health challenges than non-LGBTQ students with no or fewer assets. So if you compare the students with zero assets versus three assets and six assets, you can see that there are some dramatic changes in students' experiences with mental health challenges. Um, at zero assets, close to 90% of LGBTQ students reported persistent sadness or hopelessness. But at six assets, the rate goes down to 45%. It is still higher than non-transgender students' rates with the same number of assets, but it is about half of the risk compared to the LGBTQ students with no assets. You can see similar downward patterns for suicidal ideations and suicide attempts as they, as they report more assets. I know this was very information heavy, but the data is pretty clear to suggest that mental health concerns are rising among youth in Fairfax County and students are disproportionately affected. This also suggests that we as a community can play a critical role to protect our youth, especially, especially our at-risk students from experiencing serious mental health challenges. And the question for us might then be, can we be that trusted caring adult and community for our kids. With that question, I'll turn it over to Jesse. Thanks. Um, and, and actually, I'll ask if we can keep that slide up um, while I talk. Um, and good evening, everybody. I'm, I'm Jesse Ellis. I'm the prevention manager in the county's Department of Neighborhood and Community Services. Um, and I really want to focus on um, on this topic, on three to what we call three to succeed, right? And and Chloe has shown you two slides of what this graph looks like when we look at the number of protective factors the kids have in their lives and the prevalence of uh, these mental health issues. And you saw it both for kids overall and for LGBTQ students. Um, we have tons of similar graphs. In fact, my background is um, a compilation of, of them from actually from the, the 2019 youth survey, but they still look the same, right? And we see these same patterns if we're talking about mental health like you do here, or if we are talking about um, substance use, or if we're talking about bullying behaviors, or if we are talking about sexual activity, um, even if we're talking about whether or not kids eat their fruits and vegetables, right? Um, and we also see these same patterns when you're talking about different populations. So we saw all students and LGBTQ students, but you also see these patterns if you're breaking it down by grade level, or if you're breaking it down by race or ethnicity or gender, um, it doesn't matter, we see the same patterns. And so it really speaks to the importance of these protective factors. And while on the, for the purposes of this, um, of this analysis, we look at six different protective factors, but on the youth survey, we actually ask questions probably about 20 different protective factors. Um, we just choose these six because they're, um, they provide a good illustration of the kinds of protective factors in different domains, um, things that are specific to kids themselves, whether they uh, feel it's important to accept responsibility, for example, um, uh, but also protective factors that they have at home. You know, can you turn to a parent for help? 
protective factors they have at school? Do your do your teachers um, 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 uh, praise you when you do well? Uh, protective factors in the community. Are there adults in your neighborhood that you can go to when you when you have problems or need help? Um, and so it, the the ones that we choose for the analysis are are intentionally selected to provide that kind of range, but it's not that those are the only six things that matter, right? And so we really want to emphasize the importance of making sure kids have these positive relationships as, as, as Chloe talked about in their, in their lives, because in the end, so much of it really boils down to that. Do hey, the, Jesse, do can we go back to one more slide, I think, where the mm -hmm. protective factors are established? Sure. A, as you talk about them, I just wanted to. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, they're on. No, this no that's OK. Listed, they are listed on this slide. Um, and so it really does really come down. If you look at these things, they so much all really have to do with relationships. Participating in extracurricular activities, it's not about a kid going out and playing basketball, right? It's that when a kid goes out and plays basketball, they develop friendships. They feel respected by their coach. They feel like they belong. They feel they have a place. They they have fun, they're engaged, they feel connected to their community. It's all of those things about that activity. Um, same thing with performing community service, right? It's, it's about the relationships, it's about the sense of belonging, the sense of purpose, the, sen the, the sense of identification. Um, and those things are just really, really critical in kids' lives and they help them cope they help them develop the, the social emotional skills to deal with the challenges that they experience in life. Um, and that's what all adds up to this concept of resilience, right? And so that's why we see kids who have these things in their lives um, tend to, you know, they tend to do better. Um, you can see it's not a magic bullet. Um, there are still kids who report all six protective factors. You can see it right here on this chart. There's still one in five of them reporting signs of, of depression, right? Feeling that persistent sadness and hopelessness. Um, you know, and, but just like we probably all know somebody who has smoked two packs a day and is currently 90 years old, um, right? But that doesn't mean we would go out and encourage somebody to smoke. We know it's, it's not healthy, right? Same thing here. We want kids to build protective factors because that's what it does. It protects you, but it's also not everything. Um, and um, so there's also kind of the, the policy and the structural kinds of things that we, that we need to put in place. Um, and when you see the elevated risks for um, LGBTQ kids, there's so many things in our society that say you're not accepted, you're not welcome, um, that, it, that it further elevates that risk. And so we need to really work on that as a societal level um, to try and bring those numbers down. Um, so that's really what I wanted to focus on. There are a lot of things that we can do informally in terms of just trying to, again, encourage these healthy relationships, take the time out to, to talk to a kid, kid that walks into your house of worship, the kid that lives next door to you, the, um, um, talk to them, engage with them, be genuine, be interested, care about them if they need help, work to help help them access the help that they need, um, help them find ways to be engaged and involved, um, share resources with them. Um, there's also more formal things that, more formal things that you can do. And I know Brian's gonna cover some of, some of those in a, in a minute, so um, I won't get too much into that, but, but um, there, are, there are trainings that you can take. There are, um, uh, there are, specific programs we can get you or kids involved in um, that, that really help to, to drive all this stuff home and, and develop those relationships. So um, again, really wanted to focus on that. 
uh, the importance of these relationships, the importance of engaging with kids, making them feel cared for um, and accepted and like they have a place to belong. And, and we all know that uh, the power of faith communities to do just that. Um, so we're really excited that you're here and interested in this. All right, so, Je oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Suzette, you first. No, I was just gonna say thank you, Jesse, and I was gonna pass the baton to you, Brian. All right, and I appreciate the robust conversation that Jesse and Chloe has brought us this evening. Also want to be thoughtful and conscientious of time, and Rebecca will be helping us facilitate possibly a brief conversation based off what I bring this evening. Um, I don't have the wonderful slides that you saw previously, but I do have a lot of information. Uh, just for a brief reintroduction, again, my name is Brian Anderson. I'm a division director at the Fairfax Falls Church Community Service Board, and I'm a licensed professional counselor two times over in the state of Virginia and the state of Maryland. Uh, my goal and my purpose tonight is a few things. One, to really kind of discuss equity and setting the structural framework to understand how certain marginalized communities uh, may have uh, mental health issues, environmental issues that we, we may not always be mindful or conscientious of. Um, and also giving uh, tips, strategies, and consideration to what faith-based leaders can do in their current role in talking about mental health. So that's what, I'm, what brings me here this evening. Um, I want to talk about One Fairfax, which is uh, an initiative that was brought by County Executive Brian Hill um, to create FCPS, Fairfax County Public Schools, and local Fairfax County government to come together um, to look at these different disparities. Uh, I, along with uh, Ramona and, some, and several others, right, I think 40 equity leads was all kind of came together in 2019, where we went through some pretty rigorous training for about all of that year. This was uh, pre-pandemic in 2019. So specifically housing, transportation, uh, safety, parks, uh, public safety, parks, recreations, and different social service agencies all came together to be further understanding what equity means and what the outcomes may look like for our uh, Fairfax County residents. Some of the information I want to share with you is some of the, the disadvantages that I learned about in that training. Um, the slides that I'm not showing, but I'm gathering information from and talking with you this evening kind of speaks to that. Um, home ownership is one thing, right? So there's 12 county districts in Fairfax. Um, in particular, when it comes to home ownership for brown and black communities, the highest watermark is 60 to 65 percent, which I think is in that Springfield district. Right. So we talk about housing being a challenge uh, for different communities of color. Uh, financial disparity. There was a, a survey in 2001 and 2012. And for those that identified as African-American or black, the dollar actually dipped from twenty four dollars to twenty three dollars and thirty cents in 2012 in comparison in the year 2000. Also uh, talking about um, islands of disadvantages, how two cities can be very closely linked, right? But look completely different. So there's a slide at one point where I gathered information and looked at being in Lake Barcroft versus Bailey's Crossroads. If for Lake Barcroft residents, just to kind of give some details and information, 78% uh, of those individuals our college graduates, 72% of those individuals have private insurance. And the overall median household is $192,750. But just a couple miles away in Bailey's Crossroads, uh, it looks like 14% have higher education level, 10% have private insurance, and the median household is 47,254. Yet they're only a couple miles in distance and proximity. Um, other things to know in terms of disparities, we, we see there's also health disparities. Uh, in terms of childhood obesity, uh, Latino children uh, mark in at 43%, African-American children at 34%, and then white uh, children are at 23% range. In addition to that, uh, medical hospitalizations are up for African-Americans three times higher for heart failure, diabetes, and asthma in comparison to white and Hispanic populations. Um, our CSB, our uh, team has uh, taken on our equity impact plan and looked at how can we be intentional in consideration of how we screen in individuals to get different behavioral health services, because we saw that there were lower disproportionate numbers uh, for those that identified under, under the Asian origin and Hispanic uh, Latinx population. So that meant being very intentional with trainings, different content experts, 
um, for our master levels uh, clinicians. So that's just some of what we've done in terms of giving an overview of equity. Now, what I want to now talk about is the, the fastest growing rate in terms of demographic for those that have had more suicide ideation and suicide attempts, and that's Black youth and that's Black males. Um, there's, a perception, there's a perception sometimes that the Black youth are not committing suicide, and that's far from true. Uh, in 2017, Black youth individuals aged 10 through 19 had the second highest rate of suicide rates, um, which carried over 3,000 youth that died by suicide. Um, twice as many were Black males in comparison to white males ages 5 through 11. Now, that's suicide ideation, not necessarily attempts. Um, we also see that over the last quarter of a century, over the last 25 years, the emergence of, uh, as I mentioned, Black males and suicide attempts. That is also other risk factors. Some of what I was just briefly mentioning and talking about is there's also educational disparities, as I talked about home ownership, financial disparities, and also the stigma. Right. Sometimes, especially for black males, there could be a consideration to being bullied, uh, talking about their feelings, maybe the perception of being considered soft or weak or not masculine. So those other um, stigmas within uh, the black community in particular kind of comes up in terms of why these numbers and percentages aren't always being discussed and pronounced and talked about. Um, in addition to that, there's also exposure to trauma, um, which includes racism. Uh, discrimination, neighborhood violence, economic insecurity, and abuse on different levels. We talk physical, emotional, and sexual um, abuse. Um, and also there's grief and loss and bereavement issues that sometimes isn't always in consideration as well. So that's kind of sometimes the things that we don't always necessarily think about when it comes to data compilation. Um, specific recommendations of what we can do. Uh, we can look at evidence-based interventions that are more uh, age appropriate and culturally linguistic and relevant for Black youth to kind of help drop those numbers down. Other recommendations would include more social workers, more mental health professionals in schools that are also culturally aware, because you could put the social workers within the school system, but they don't, they don't have the awareness um, and the insight to understand the complexities of different uh, marginalized communities. Uh, the rates may not improve because they just may not have the education or wherewithal or cultural humility to move the needle. Now, I also want to give some information with regards to what faith, what faith leaders can do in terms of just being conscientious and thoughtful. Um, in terms of prevention, it's a lot of preaching and teaching to your congregation, uh, being very thoughtful in consideration that your congregation may be dealing with these same issues too, but it's not talked about. It may be ignored. There may be a perception that I can't really discuss. This is what I'm experiencing, what I'm feeling. So just having those conversations, normalizing the discussion is important. It's very relevant. Um, also, when it comes to prevention, uh, be actively involved with good folks like me and others that may work in social services, right? Partner up with us, different mental health organizations. You know, Re Rebecca also works with NAMI. You know, have foster stronger and cohesive and collaborative relationships so this doesn't become a, a one-off situation. Um, also be mindful of, you know, your internal views of suicide and how that may help or hinder someone who comes to you and is struggling with depression, suicide, and anxiety, and what the perception of what they bring back after talking to you based on your attitudes, views, and beliefs. Um, you know, I've, brief, I've been talking about culture quite a bit, but also take that into account in terms of the person you're talking to and being an active listener as well. Um, recognizing warning signs, um, doing what we call a brief risk assessment, and what that means and uh, looking at, you know, does this, the person have uh, a prior history of uh, feeling suicidal? Has there been any prior suicide attempts? Um, you know, what else, what other protective factors, as Jesse and Chloe kind of talked about, are involved in play with the person that's coming to you and maybe feeling suicidal? Um, and if all else fails, you know, Fairfax County has emergency service line, which I can drop in the chat later, 703-573-5679. Um, so you don't have to make those independent decisions alone or be unilateral in your decision-making process where you're not sure. So those are different things faith leaders can do. Uh, now I want to kind of expand and talk a little more about uh, warning signs that we come about. And we see this in three different ways. We see it in the way people talk with us, the mood that someone's in, and their behavior. Um, when you hear someone talking about wanting to die or kill themselves, of course, we have to be very uh, considerate to take it as a very urgent matter. Sometimes it's not always so obvious and blatant. Um, sometimes they may feel um, hopeless or 
necessarily can't identify reasons to live um, and they may feel trapped or feeling like a burden to others. You know, those those are key red flags to really pick up in conversations when you have with people within your congregation or even as, in the community as a whole that you may engage or interface with. Uh, the mood, right? Mood is important. Uh, have they lost interest in things that normally will bring them happiness or satisfaction or fulfillment? Do they seem a little more irritable than usual? Um, do they seem a little more withdrawn, disconnected, a little isolative? They're not really having conversations with people where that's outside their norm. Um, is there a higher level of anxiety, constantly feeling worried and a little more restless? Um, you can kind of see this in their presentation in terms of their body language and what we call their affect, which is just overall how you see their uh, facial, uh, their nonverbal, so to speak, in their body language collectively. And then also we look at behavior also. Um, specifically, are they sleeping more than usual? Are they not getting enough sleep? Um, are they talking or if they're looking up and researching different ways to kill themselves by going online? Um, do, is there more increased substance use where there's alcohol uh, use more frequently than usual or other drug use? Um, in addition to that, are they talking about giving away their prized possessions? Um, trying to visit people for the last time, saying this may be one of the uh, last times you see me, or calling people to say their goodbyes. All that is heightened uh, signs that someone's at imminent risk of suicide. Um, so those are some of the key different areas. Of course, there's also triggered events. You know, I briefly talked about grief and bereavement issues. Sometimes when close people pass away from people to individuals, they start to kind of take on those feelings and start to uh, look at their life in totality as well. Um, I'm getting close to my time because I want to give space to Rebecca, but the only other things I'll kind of give you for a few takeaways is a lot of information came from question, persuade, refer, we affection call it. QPR. Um, Suzette can send information as need to. So you can sign up to get a little more robust information on some of the things I've shared. We also have what's called a lock and talk series, which helps um, take in consideration how we need to lock up firearms, medications. We also give lock boxes so we can kind of safely put those things away and out of harm's way for individuals that may be directly impacted by um, having suicidal ideations. Um, so with that, that is pretty much all I have. We do also have the, the mental health first aid training that can be done in person or virtually. And it's done kind of on demand. It's always virtual because we've been in this pandemic space for the last two and a half years. But if there's in-person requests, that's something that internally we can kind of funnel in those, um, those type of requests that come into uh, wellness, health, promotion, and prevention. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Suzette. Thank you, Brian. And um, before you begin, Rebecca, I just want to let everyone know that you will be sent a list of resources um, that have the, some of the programs that Brian was talking about, as well as information around signs and symptoms um, and what to look for the QPR. So you will get a whole list of resources. Rebecca? Good evening. Everybody take a deep breath. <laughs> That was a lot of information you were just given for the last hour. And it was really good information, but it was a lot. Um, and I don't know about you, but we have a NAMI affiliate down in Charlottesville um, that we've been supporting. So it's just a lot. So I want everybody to make sure that you give yourself some space and you just heard a lot of statistics. So just make sure that as you're taking all of that in, you're giving yourself some space as well. And that is something you can do for everyone that you support as well. Um, my name is Rebecca Kiesling. I'm the executive director of NAMI Northern Virginia. Um, we are the affiliate of the big NAMI, which happens to be headquartered in Arlington, sometimes a little confusing. Um, and we support Fairfax County, Loudoun County, and Arlington, Alexandria, Falls Church, and everything around it. So a little bit over 2 million people in about a thousand square miles or so. And what that support is, is free mental health, peer-led um, support, advocacy, and stigma-breaking education. And that's our goal. Um, it's been our goal and our mission for about 45 years. We're celebrating 45 years starting on Thursday. Um, and that's what we're here for. And I have, you know, I, I spoke with Suzette a couple of months ago because one of the things that we want to do in the next year um, is 
engage the faith community more. It's very important to me uh, personally. Um, I thought about going to, I thought really hard and I tried really hard to go to seminary quite a few times. Um, I have a diploma in theology. I went to, did pathway to ministry, couldn't get there. Um, it wasn't my calling and that's okay. But as I started at NAMI, um, a little bit of a couple of days over seven months ago, um, I realized that that's not something that we do. Um, in our work in Northern Virginia, um, there are bits and pieces that we talk to within the faith community, but we don't actively engage and we have to because what Jesse and Brian and Chloe have said is that a lot of talk, a lot of talk happens within your walls. Um, a lot of times that there are, oh, I'm sorry, NAMI is the National Alliance on Mental, for, uh, mental Illness, on mental illness. Um, and it's a, it's a large um, national organization with um, state organizations in every state, all 50 states, and then local affiliates. There's over 700 local affiliates, and some are super small, and thanks, Jesse, um, and some are rather large, like ours. Um, so from New York City is a pretty large affiliate, Chicago, but then there's some rather small ones like Blue Ridge, NAMI Blue Ridge, which has, has um, Charlottesville and UVA. So um, we have a full staff. We have a staff of five, almost six, and um, a great board of directors and um, office space in Oakton, but we are a hybrid um, working space now. Um, this is my home, not I, it's a nice little screen behind me. Um, and so we are part of that larger alliance. We are our own standalone 501c3, and we just get to use the great brand and all of their resources. Um, but I'm not here to talk about what we do. Um, I'd love to share more about that, what we have later, but I wanna hear from you. And Suzette that was great to allow me that time. Um, so as we open it up to all of your questions about what you've heard, um, I'd love to not just, all of those questions, yes, um, for Jesse and Brian and Chloe, but also, um, I'd like to know what you're hearing and what your needs are within your, the walls of your communities. Um, because we might have the resources to help already, but in terms of what I'm doing, maybe we can help. Um, maybe we already are doing it or NAMI somewhere in the country is doing it. Um, but we also have the ability to try to find out how to do it. And that's what I'm looking for. So um, I'd love to turn it over. If somebody would, you can raise your hand. You can do whatever you want here. And I want to say, uh, feel free to turn on your camera since we're in discussion mode, if you feel comfortable with that and are, and are able to. Um, my church, uh, Abiding Presence, has has done some things with NAMI before. And, um, you know, we're very grateful for that um, one thing that we've talked about is um, maybe being able to have um, NAMI come in and do like the Ending the Silence um, program for the youth, which as I understand it is primarily about teaching the youth um, the real basics of mental illness and, and what would be a concern for them to get help for themselves or for a friend and, and how they could go about doing that. Yeah, so Ending the Silence, thank you, Stephanie, I appreciate it. Um, ending the Silence is a great presentation and it has um, two presenters, two peers. One is a young adult. Um, we try not to have a child, um, but a young, a young person who has been through some kind of mental illness. Um, and then a, a adult, it doesn't have to be related to that person, but an adult who has also seen um, what happens. Um, and it's two different points of view. Um, we have ETS for that's geared to the young person, but there's also ETS, same presenters can do it, that's geared towards parents because there is a different message. Um, and it's a wonderful presentation. If anybody's interested, we're actually doing one virtually. Um, 
as our part of our monthly meeting this year, uh, this month. So I can put that information up. You can just register and come see it if you're interested in what it looks like. But Stephanie, I'll get in touch with you. Great. <coughs> Elsa just had a question um, about um, you know, the, the numbers that um, are from the survey. In that particular study, it looked to me like um, the Black students were at the lowest risk for um, feelings of persistent hopelessness and suicidal thoughts and suicidal ideation. Um, but then I wasn't sure that that went with what Brian was saying. So know that my information comes from a national perspective and okay. the information you heard was from Fairfax County. So sorry, I didn't you know, distinguish. You know, when I, that trend is coming from a nation's perspective, not just local county. Okay. Okay, so that'd be really interesting to know then, like, I wonder what protective factors, you know, these particular youth are having in Fairfax County that is a little bit different, you know, if, if I don't know, I mean, it would just be interesting. I, I can probably add a little bit of context too. Um, one thing is, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but, but the numbers are really about, are, is are really suicide rates. So the, right. the, the the yeah. rates, the numbers of kids who die by suicide, it's growing fastest among among um, uh, young black males, right? right. Um, at a local level, it's really hard to um, identify those kinds of trends at all because the the suicide numbers are so low in Thankfully. the Fairfax district that um, it, it, it that those kinds of trends don't don't show up just because the numbers, oh. you know, like it's fewer than 10 youth who die a, a year by suicide. Um, and while, um, while obviously, um, you know, persistent sadness and, and, and hopelessness is, is where we see the biggest numbers, right? Um, we often think about that as kind of, um, depressive symptoms, signs of depression, but there's also a lot of other signs and symptoms yeah. of depression. And in particular, we often see boys <laughs> expressing different signs and symptoms, which I think leads to part of the, the gender disparity that we see right. too, mm -hmm. where girls are reporting this at such a higher rate. Um, there's also differences when you break things down, again, at a national level where the numbers are so much bigger in terms of the relationships between suicide attempts and actual suicides. Um, right. And so where females attempt suicide much more often than, than males, males die by suicide much more frequently than females. And that generally comes down to the method, right? They use more lethal means, um, most often guns, um, boys are more likely to use, you know, men are more likely to use guns. And so they're more likely to die by suicide. And so there's, there's a lot of nuance when they break down the, those numbers. Um, but um, just knowing that those young black male numbers have been rising nationally, certainly that's a di another data point for us to, to make sure that we are emphasizing that in, in our work, because that might not get picked up in the youth survey, the way that the questions are. They've also found an, a lot of misdiagnosis among black youth, um, black youth period. So when you have a black youth acting out um, mm -hmm. in school, is it a mental health issue or is it a black kid misbehaving? And that's what, you know, instead of getting this, this black youth or this youth, um, mental health treatment that is needed, it's a kid that's misbehaving. Um, you have more black people who are schizophrenic ending up in police custody rather than getting psychiatric treatment. Those numbers are overwhelming across the country and we're seeing that in Fairfax County as well. Um, so it's a lot of that is a misdiagnosis. So we have to get that under control as well. 
Oh, can I jump into where Rebecca yeah, left off? I saw yeah, the nod would, there. I saw the nod. <laughs> oh, you were talking my language, especially when it comes to the diagnosing piece on a couple of different levels, right? And especially when it comes to youth and Black youth, quite often in the field of mental health, if a Black, a young Black youth is um, evaluating and assessed, it may look like conduct disorder, or oppositional mm -hmm. defined disorder, where it's really a reaction to trauma. Where it's maybe where PTSD may be the more appropriate diagnosis. They may be uh, more of a label of oppositional defiance, which creates a stigma within itself and a perception of per perpetuates, you know, how black males can be perceived, right? So that's a really important factor. Also, the one piece I didn't mention because I wanted to make sure there was enough time to have this conversation is that a lot of times on a national level, black youth are black youth are going right to suicide attempts. They're not engaged with the diagnosis or, or disorder in some instances, and they're not in treatment. Um, so that was the other thing I didn't mention because we were just, I wanted to again have this conversation collectively as a, as a, as a group. So those are just other uh, cultural considerations to think about, consider when you look at percentages and numbers. What else can we dive into? And what else are you seeing? So whether it's one of the, when a, whether it's a question from one of the, the great pieces that you know, Brian, Jesse, or Chloe had brought up or something that you're seeing that you want to discuss. Um, let's bring it up. So I, I do have a quick question that I um, wanted to ask, um, and it's really sort of a bottom line for me. So if I'm a, a clergy member, if I'm, you know, teaching a Sunday school class, um, if I'm a parent and I see someone who has I'm worried about, they're exhibiting some of the signs. What is the first thing I do? Because you all gave a lot of information, but what is the first thing I do? Do I call my primary care physician because we have private insurance? Like, what, what do I do? I'm gonna say the first thing then I'm gonna let other people go. Ask them if they're okay. That's the very first thing. You know, there's a lot of misconception that if you ask or if you put, you know, the the word suicide out there, then they're going to automatically be suicidal. It's not true. Sometimes people just need somebody to talk to or somebody to feel like somebody cares. Ask them if they're okay. And then there's a whole bunch of other things. There's other steps out there. Um, and I'll let you know, Jesse or Brian talk about some of the other people, some of the other things that are out there for the, for you as someone that cares. And I'm asking about my first call though, not all the resources that we have, my first call to get help. 988, three team. little numbers, 988. If you really think that somebody might be um, going to hurt themselves, 988, because there's somebody on the other line that can help you. And there's somebody on the other line that can tell you where to go, 988. You don't have to go to 911. You don't have to, you know, try to get patched into somebody else. You can dial 988. And 988 has trained people that can help you and can get you through to the right people. Um, if you don't know and you're calling 911, make sure you ask for a CIT, um, somebody that is a trained CIT to be involved in uh, what they bring you. I mean, how can I go behind Rebecca when she said everything I was going to mention? I have right? to go 988, you know, yeah. with NAMI, we talk about 988. You know, the only thing I'll just kind of add on to is, you know, one thing we all share in common, we're in the helping field, right, on, on one stage or another. So asking someone how they're doing before overreacting um, and, and just talking and having a conversation with somebody, you'll learn quite a bit. Um, developing that relationship, also modeling that if it's okay not to be okay and talk with them. And then when we find that information that they're not okay, that's when, um, you know, depending on what you're hearing, using what Rebecca gave you, um, I gave the phone number to emergency services, which can either bring folks right out to where the person is, if they're having a hard time coming to an emergency service location in Fairfax. Um, so literally they have what's called a mobile crisis unit where they will physically drive over there if there's a mental health crisis going on at the moment. So if someone's overwhelmed, then as Rebecca mentioned, there are CIT officers that are equipped to come out there who are trained specifically as law enforcement or public safety to help someone and not come from a criminal perspective, but come to figure out what the psychiatric need is. So 
so my questions to you um, as faith leaders, um, when you get, are you finding that as, pe as, your, as people in your communities um, are facing, uh, no, 988, I'm sorry, Jessica, 988 is across the country. Starting in July, July 13, 16th of this year, it was federally mandated that every single community in the country um, has the ability to, con to call 988. It is, um, it, it took over the uh, suicide prevention hotline um, and now 988 is available ac across the country. So um, it is, it is suicide prevention, but it's mental health crisis um, hotline. Um, and, you know, it, the fact that we're not yelling and screaming at, I am, if you can't tell, um, and we should be yelling it and screaming it all over the place. And if anybody wants posters or anything, I'm, I'm sure I can get those to you to put up. Um, I'm trying to get them up in all the schools because, Three little numbers. Um, if someone comes to you, um, this has happened to us. Uh, we have a helpline. It's a warm line, so it's resources, much like uh, everyone's giving here today. Um, it's not a hotline, so meaning like 988. It's not that. It's a helpline, so resources. Um, really wonderful people who know a lot more than I do, but. A question that's asked to them sometimes is, what have I done wrong? Why do bad things happen to good people? Um, and as people in the faith community, um, I'm sure you get that a lot. So how do you bring the conversation around mental health into that? Because when you're talking about stigma, um, you, you're at the forefront of breaking that stigma surrounding mental health. That's something we all do is talking about breaking the stigma because mental health is like physical health. Well, that's what we've said, like in Sunday school, we've talked about it. I, I work with middle schoolers in Sunday mm. school and um, we've, we've talked about mental health resources and talked about how like, you know, it's, nobody's ashamed when they come in on crutches because they hurt their knee playing basketball and they weren't ashamed to tell their parents like that they'd hurt their knee. Um, and in the same way, like we don't have to be ashamed to, to struggle with, uh, with anxiety or depression or any other mental health thing. And it's something that is okay to talk about. Great, that's great. And that's, that's kind of what I was getting at is, um, you know, we talk about the, the Surgeon General just had, came, up, came out with a report and he was saying mental health is, or you can't have one without the other, basically. And that's, that's kind of what we're, I think, you know, majority of us are saying as well is, as you're getting those questions, um, talking about breaking stigma, which is, you know, Brian got into a lot. Um, how do we do that? I love that, I, you know, I love that approach. Anybody else, do you, do you have anything? any ways that you do it within your communities? Yeah, so this is Mike. Um, I just let my kids know that God made you perfectly. It's for the rest of society to figure out how to accept you. So, and unfortunately it doesn't work very well in today's society. <laughs> um, you have to have a lot of confidence to, to move forward uh, with that kind of, mindset but uh i try to instill in them early that you know you you don't have to worry about other people judging you it's it's not for them to judge you you and, and you shouldn't judge yourself you should just be who you are and move forward and you know be a good christian you know as a as a methodist and and accept those things and and try to build the relationship with the other youth so that when, you know, when people are mean, because they all are mean, uh, you have somebody to, to reach out to, to, you know, appreciate what you've gone through and, 
and, and know that you all have the same faith and to move forward. So again, it's very hard in this, in this society to do, but, uh, but that's what I'm trying to, to let my kids know. Yeah. I mean, I think that's great. I, I think it was Jesse was talking about community and the, the different, you know, we're talking about different, not necessarily sports, but it's community that's helping um, statistically people either with a mental health concern or people who don't know that they have a mental health concern, but statistically are pr probably will at some point. Um, but that it's the community, it's community that helps people um, get through things. Uh, so building it early and enforcing, you know, that that is so important, whatever that community is, is great. Does anybody else? Now, if I could just get all the same kids to show up on Sunday every week, then I could build that community, but <laughs> hey. it's just catch as catch can. So yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Rebecca, thank you for that. I do have one more thing. Rebecca, I remember when you and I talked earlier, you wanted to talk about how you could partner with Houses of Worship. So if anyone on this call would like to um, partner with you, how should they get in touch with you? I'm going to put my, if I can remember how to type, my email address and phone number below. And I would love to speak with you. Um, about, you know, everyone is an individual and every denomination, every faith, um, every community is in, is our individuals. And, you know, I'd love to learn from you and learn what your needs are so that we can try to help support um, what your needs are. So please reach out. Thank you. Um, and it's 8.30, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I do want to thank our speakers for taking time to give such wonderful information. This was great. Thank you all so much um, for coming. We do have a survey that I would ask um, everyone to fill out the survey. It will go in the chat. Um, it will also be sent out in the email. I will send out the resources as well um, in an email so you all can have that. This meeting is being recorded and it will be uploaded on our um, on the website for the um, interfaith coordinator. That will also be in the email, but the, the video won't be uploaded for a couple of days. So give it some time, you will have that. Um, and then, of course, if you are not signed up for Common Ground, that is also in the chat. So please sign up for the Common Ground um, newsletter. That's where you'll get all the information um, about our meetings, which, again, are every third Tuesday from 7 to 8. Um, to reiterate, we won't be having a meeting in December but we will definitely start again in January. So put that on your calendar, save the date. And um, thank you all again. Uh, Chloe, can, can you, and <clears throat> I had a quick question. Maybe sure. I put it on the thing. How do I get um, answers to some of the specific questions on the youth survey? Um, you can absolutely email me. I can um, type my email address. That'd be lovely. Thank you. Yep, sure. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Don't forget to stop recording.